morning now. Your gate number is 109. Have a nice flight. Thank you. The ship enthusiast and me could so relate to that excited kid sitting across from us in the Turkish Air Lounge at Istanbul, our penultimate stop on our long journey from California in the summer of 1997. Have a nice flight. Thank you. Soon, our last flight segment would depart for the Ukraine, where two classic ex Cunard liners awaited, two ships I never imagined I would see in person for over 20 years since I first fell in love with ocean liners as a kid. With many thanks to the kindness of contacts I made in Odessa after years of false starts, this dream was finally coming true. And just in the nick of time, for my two coveted ships had reached the end of their useful lives after more than two decades under the Soviet and later Ukrainian flag. We were met by our host and his driver at the Odessa airport and were soon driving past the Potemkin steps for a short tour of Odessa's highlights before checking into our hotel. It's so sad to think that this beautiful historic city and the Ukraine itself is now under siege. When we visited, it was emerging from the shadows of communism and there was much hope for Ukraine's future. Not a day passes now that I don't think of our host Igor director of ASMAR, the company that once supplied Ukrainian crew to many cruise lines. We wrapped up our short orientation of Odessa at the top of the Potemkin steps with a view overlooking the harbor and our hotel, the river cruise ship Taras Shevchenko. Not to be confused with the ocean liner of the same name, I was told the Taras Shevchenko once operated between Ukraine and Russia on the Dnipro River. She was a comfortable and convenient place to stay at her berth at the passenger terminal, which was under much construction. After settling in, we went ashore to explore the Brutalist Terminal, once home base to the bustling Black Sea Shipping Company's vast fleet of passenger ships. Although we never felt unsafe, Igor advised us not to venture out on our own, so we took in the view from the outer decks and the terminal of Odessa's fascinating harbor. I would later learn there had been some recent kidnappings, although in general, Odessa was a safe city for tourists at the time. Dialer Line's interesting Captain Zaman was berthed behind us, the 2,375 gross ton ferry was built in 1961 as the Katigat and was then operating between Istanbul and Odessa. She was sold in 2000 and in 2003 wrecked off the coast of Sudan as the Jassim. In the late 1960s, the Soviets commissioned a platform of no less than 11 3,284 gross ton Polish built research ships including the Georgi Ushakov, which was built in 1971. At this point in time, the once esteemed ship was then running between Istanbul and the Black Sea, carrying anything and everything imaginable, with every inch of her deck space crammed with goods. As fascinating as she is alarming to behold, this overladen workhorse has long since vanished from the registers and is presumed scrapped. The next morning, on his way to his office to secure permission for us to visit the shipyard in Ilichovsk, where the two ex Cunarders awaited, Igor took us to more sites, including the beautiful Opera House. Locked and under restoration, this is where Fyodor Shalyapin, the legendary opera singer and actor, who one of the ships I had come to see was named after, performed.
Once at the office, we waited in the car as Igor gathered his comrade, Mr. Arkady Ivanov, and then took us to our next stop, the Maritime Museum. Housed in a palatial building built in 1842, the museum was closed, so we had the place to ourselves. Our visits started chronologically with classic sailing ships and artifacts from historic naval vessels. For me, it got really interesting when we got to the more modern merchant fleet. Admittedly, there were some ships I didn't know, but others like the Pobida, the Ex-Iberia, the Talanin, and especially the Rossia, the Expatria, were like exotic legends from the pages of books I had studied as a kid. The Baltica, built in Holland in 1939, had only been retired a decade prior. Separate from the others, in a chandeliered and fresco-ceilinged hall, there was a model of another favorite, the 1964-built Ivan Franco, which had sailed off for scrapping the previous year. Right next to her, the 1974-built Maria Yermolova apparently still exists in 2024. Um, he worked on the Gorky, right? And the Gorky, yeah. He worked, and didn't he work on the Kazakhstan or Azerbaijan? Yes, he worked on Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan and Maxim Gorky. Right. As what, hotel manager? Yes, hotel manager. And uh, Konstantin Simonov. Oh, Konstantin Simonov. While we waited to hear back from the shipyard, my traveling companion Kevin videotaped a short interview I did with Igor and Mr. Ivanov. Mr. Ivanov literally wrote the training manual for the Ukrainian Merchant Marine and had been hotel manager on numerous liners, including the ill-fated Admiral Nakimov, which sank after colliding with a bulk carrier in 1986. Mr. Ivanov was fortunately not on that sailing, which claimed 423 lives. The Nakimov was the former Berlin of 1925, and after it was sunk near Kiel in 1945, he was part of the crew sent to raise the ship. He reminisced about diving off the wreck, which the Soviets raised and restored, and kept operating until the disaster. <laughs> We also talked about another ill-fated favorite, the Mikhail Lermontov, which sank in New Zealand after colliding with submerged rocks in 1986. And, uh, Lermontov came to California in 1977 or 78. I went down to, to photograph her, and they had guards everywhere on the pier. I was not allowed on the pier. Uh, I had... I was a little kid, I was um, 15, 16, and the uh, U.S. Mm -hmm. people came to me and said, you can't take pictures of this ship, this is a Russian ship, you can't take pictures of a Russian ship. Lermontov, только-только мы вложили 11 миллионов марок в ВНГ, мы его переоборудовали. Только вот он закончил переоборудование, пошел, это были его первые. Лермонтов sent exactly after the renovation in Fiat the cost of this renovation was 11 million of Deutschmark. <laughs> oh, and then it was on two months. Boom. After two months, sent. I could have talked ships with these kind and fascinating men all day and then some, but once we got the thumbs up from the shipyard, it was time to begin our journey to Ilichovsk. The 12 mile drive from Odessa takes about 30 minutes which is just enough time to brush up on the history of the ex Cunarders I came to see, two of four beautiful liners known as the Saxonia Sisters. Today, many people only know Cunard as a premium cruise line with what will soon be four modern ships named for British queens. Of course, Cunard is legendary for its New York to UK liner service, but it was also an important link between Canada and the UK. So seven decades before the era of four queens, we had the era of four saxes. In 1951, Cunard announced a new class of ships was to be built for their Liverpool to Montreal service. The first of what was to be two, but eventually became four, 22,000 gross ton, two-class ships, was to be called Saxonia. 
Named for the Roman province of Saxony, which is now in eastern Germany, Saxonia was handsome and well-proportioned and distinguished with her dome-topped aluminum funnel. Renderings of the new ship promise Canadian-themed decor in both classes, a sumptuous but small first accommodating 125 passengers and some of the finest tourist class trappings on the Atlantic with 800 berths. Tourist class passengers have their own double-deck lounge and vibrant modern spaces that were a break from the more traditionally decorated cunarders of the time. The construction contract would go to John Brown and Company of Clydebank, Scotland, builders of the first two queens and the legendary green goddess Coronia of 1948. Saxonia's godmother was none other than Lady Churchill, who despite poor weather, sent the ship down the slipway on February 17, 1954. In addition to a stern anchor for navigating the St. Lawrence, Saxonia was distinguished for her lion rampant Cunard Bowcrest, a first in the fleet. The fitting out process took six months and the handsome 21,637 gross ton ship departed on her maiden voyage from Liverpool to Quebec and Montreal on September 2nd, 1954. This log abstract shows her under the command of legendary Captain John Treasure Jones for a Southampton departure in 1960 with an average crossing speed of 19.79 knots. In first class, the smoking room had a more traditional Regency style, while the first class Yukon bar was adorned with Canadian themed panels by artist Tom Lusney. First class enjoyed the balcony level of the 300 seat cinema and the Forward Maple Leaf Restaurant, which featured historic Canadian motifs and maple leaf pattern decking. Lunch menus in both French and English included selections like roast lamb and tapioca custard pudding, while dinner courses included choices like calf's head vinaigrette and for vegetarians, cottage cheesecake with hot potato salad. Standouts from this 1955 farewell dinner menu include turtle soup and a selection of ice cream flavors like maple, walnut, cherry, and banana. Tourist class had run of most of the ship, including the bottom level of the cinema, as well as a Choctaw smoking room featuring native Choctaw designs. Meanwhile, the soaring tourist class lounge had woven glass panels in what was called an atomic pattern inspired by the structure of an atom and green carpeting with wildflower detailing. In nearly all spaces, the ceilings featured backlit cutouts, which some critics derided as looking mouse-eaten. Saxonia's casual tourist garden lounge opened onto the promenade and featured live plants, while the drawing room and library were a bit more stately. There was even a dedicated tourist class nursery. Basing its name and decorative theme on a Native American wild strawberry, the aft Odamine restaurant spanned the width of the ship. A tourist class lunch menu from 1957 mentions pork chops, roulade of veal with baked beans, and plum flan. And a dinner menu from 1958 taunts with sweetbreads, or thymus glands, Saint-Germain, and ox tongue. The initial success of the Saxonia sisters was soon diminished by the meteoric rise of the jet airplane. In June 1962, Saxonia was sent to John Brown for a transformation into the cruise ship Carmania. Ivernia soon followed, becoming the Franconia. Painted in multiple shades of green like the Coronia and second Mauritania, the Carmania boasted full air conditioning, a huge Lido with a heated pool, and swank new interiors by Jean Monroe, affectionately known as the Queen of Chintz. 
Monroe was fresh from designing the interiors of three Union Castle liners and had up-and-coming Michael Inchbald on her team. Inchbald would go on to design the QE2's interiors. Carmania's instant success as a cruise ship led Cunard to deploy more ships for off-season cruising as more and more people chose to cross the Atlantic by air. This log from one of her last Canadian crossings in 1967 shows her at an average of 18.78 knots. Carmania's stylish Lido with its heated kidney-shaped pool was the envy of the cruise industry. Soon the venerable Queen Elizabeth would get one just like it, albeit on a much larger scale. The alfresco bar was ideal for the tropics, as were four state-of-the-art fiberglass tenders. With her new one-class cruising role taking prominence, Carmania's first-class and tourist-class areas were more egalitarian. The first-class St. Lawrence bar and forward promenade deck boasted bright gold and coral tones, while the Albany room featured similar colors with floral or chintz soft fittings and spindly chandeliers that were Monroe's trademark look. First Class had its own library on forward promenade deck with custom stationery, and up at the top of the ship, there was a modern sunroom that looked out onto the sports deck. A suite of completely modern suites was added with furnishings that would be right at home on a Bewitch set, or if you prefer, the Avengers. And nearby, there were freshly revamped First Class Deluxe staterooms. The first class restaurant had been restyled as the Garden Restaurant with its pink and pine color scheme and more of Monroe's chintz patterned curtains. I'll have to concede the most exciting space was in tourist class, the combination Island Club and Nantucket Room, a double deck space overlooking the stern Lido that was connected with a Y-shaped grand staircase. Tourist class also boasted the 10 Pin Club, a bowling alley with a jukebox, and even a self-service launderette, way ahead of its time. While still sporting their original look, comfortable tourist class cabins were now all fitted with private facilities. The tourist class Tivoli restaurant had a new look with mirrors on its inner bulkheads and more chintz floral curtains. And now let's sample some of the food here. Breakfast offered three types of bacon and buckwheat pancakes, as well as Horlicks and very strangely spelled yogurt. For lunch on the delivery voyage from John Brown's to Southampton, journalists and travel agents were offered a grilled spring chicken. And main dinner courses on a 1966 West Indies cruise included brill, bream, chicken cacciatore, and split lamb's kidneys. In late 1966, Carmania had been given a new all-white livery. As Cunard was in a downward spiral, they began retiring most of their liner fleet, including the Queen Mary, Queen Elizabeth, and Caronia. Carmania and Franconia soldiered on as cruise ships, but by 1971, both were in need of major refits, and were laid up with Shaw Savile Line's redundant Southern Cross at Southampton and offered for sale. In 1972, they were moved to the River Fall. One prospective buyer, Ted Arison, almost purchased them for his new startup, Carnival Cruise Line. Instead, he went with the larger Empress of Canada, which became Carnival's first ship, the Mardi Gras. In August of 1973, a beard Panamanian corporation bought them for their new role under the hammer and sickle as the Soviet Union's premier cruise ships. Carmania was renamed Leonid Sobonov after the famous Russian singer and actor. Few, if any, changes were needed or made to the Leonid Sobonov other than new funnel markings and renamed public rooms. The Soviets had no budget to make any real alterations which is why these two ships were such perfect time capsules in their dotage. 
CTC lines chartered both ships in the mid-70s for cruises to and from Australia. Both were quite popular, although there were widely publicized defections from some of their Soviet crew members. Their solid construction certainly came in handy during rough sea conditions. Soviet models, or perhaps well-dressed crew members, were now featured in brochures from the era, cavorting in familiar spaces that sported new names, all looking a little faded, if not threadbare, with the passage of time. In every brochure, the once swank suites were prominently featured, always with a smiling young lady. Even the former tourist class staterooms came with the smiling young lady. In the shop, there are self-conscious poses with the wonderful Leonid Sobanov duffel bag. Original Kinar chairs can be seen in the reading room. There are shiny, happy people at the Purser's Bureau. Hair gets a natural 70s style in the salon, and children play on dirty carpet in the nursery. And you know what? I would absolutely kill to sail in this ship today. In the once sophisticated ballroom, Instead of today's Cirque du Soleil-style extravaganzas with too many lights and sound effects, there were Russian folkloric performances. It was all about waitresses, stateroom attendants, and deck crew teaming up in a showcase of national pride. The hard-working Leonid Sobanov carried on switching between crews and liner service and even trooping Cuban soldiers to Angola, in 1989, she was given a refit at Piraeus that kept her going until she was laid up at Ilichevsk in 1995, where we will soon pay her a visit. Cunard Line's second Ivernia, which is our second Saxonia sister, was named for the Roman province now known as Ireland. Oh, for the days when Cunard ships had inspiring IA names. In almost every aspect, the handsome Ivernia was the twin of Saxonia with her 44-foot tall domed funnel and distinctive stern anchor. And like Saxonia, renderings of her first and tourist class interiors promised a contemporary look with Canadian and native motifs. Ivernia was built alongside the Saxonia at John Brown and Company. On December 14, 1954, she was launched by Mrs. D.C. Howe, wife of Canada's Minister of Trade, although the Prime Minister's wife was originally slated to do the honors. As with Saxonia, the weather for the launch was challenging, and in the process, the Ivernia stern almost collided with the opposite riverbank but with the help of six tugs, she was moved to her fitting outberth. While almost identical to Saxonia, Ivernia carried 15 fewer first-class passengers. She could be distinguished from her sister by the large rectangular windows on her forward boat deck instead of portholes. She would be the only one of the four ships with this feature. Ivernia began her trials on June 13th and made her maiden voyage to Canada on July 1st, 1955. The first class lounge spanned the width of the ship. Note that door with the three portholes, a fixture used throughout the public spaces. One of the most remarkable rooms was the Mounties Bar. The color scheme reflected indigenous trees and transport, and the overall theme on the wall panel artwork was the Mountie Always Gets His Man. Her handsome first-class cabins boasted mahogany-trimmed tiger maple veneers. Like the Saxonia, the balcony of her 300-seat cinema theater was reserved for first class. The tourist class Amber Lounge had a dome central ceiling and bay windows overlooking the promenade. 
As with Saxonia, she had a garden lounge with live plants and a stately tourist class drawing room. The city cousin's smoking room had panels that depicted British cities and their Canadian namesakes and sharply angled furnishings. The bulkheads in the tourist class restaurant featured Canadian floral medallions and the tourist class cabins were enriched with oak and mahogany veneers. In their ongoing side-by-side -side saga, Ivernia joined Saxonia at their builders in late 1962 for their cruise ship transformations. In most respects, as Franconia, she would be identical to Carmania, but with a few decorative tweaks. Sporting her new green livery, Franconia made her maiden crossing in the fall of 1963, then established herself on New York-based winter cruises to the Caribbean. Her gorgeously restyled Lido boasted a larger bar just aft of the pool versus Carmania's, which was off to the port side. For the first several years as Franconia, this green beauty would dutifully alternate between summer crossings to Canada and winter cruising. Like Carmania, her first class had a modern sunroom on sports deck that looked out to the deck tennis court at the base of her funnel. First class had the run of the nice teak line decks at the top of the ship. First class also had the parasol bar with a parasol top circular bar in its center. Kelly Green soft fittings and chintz curtains were signature Jean Monroe touches. Just after the parasol on promenade deck, the Maple Leaf Lounge was a coolly elegant study in slate and seafoam green. And on the port side, a modern library and reading room replaced the Ivernia's first class Mounties Bar. A little farther aft on the port side, there was the first class beauty salon. Like Carmania, Franconia had six super modern suites. And unlike Carmania, she had forward facing deluxe cabins with those large rectangular windows on boat deck I mentioned earlier. And we'll wrap up the first class with the restaurant, which was restyled in coral and black as the clock restaurant and featured an antique clock centerpiece. As with Carmania, Tourist Class was home to Franconia's most exciting space, the combination Cactus Club and Mayflower Room, which overlooked the Lido from boat and promenade decks respectively. The rooms were linked via a sweeping curved staircase versus the Y-shaped Carmania's. Although elegant and of their era, the revamped public rooms on both ships were as much disparaged by Cunard traditionalists as they were loved by the cruising public. In that respect, nothing changes. That said, one space that thankfully did not evolve was the tourist class library on aft promenade deck with its gorgeous bowed glass walnut cabinets that are now part of my home in Oceanside, along with many other fittings from this beautiful ship. 40 years before NCL claimed to have the first bowling alley at sea, Franconia and Carmenia had the Ten Pin Club, which was also the teen hangout with its jukebox. Ferry Cross the Mercy, Blue Velvet, or Wipe Out Anyone? Jean Monroe's floral murals and coral green and yellow soft fittings gave the tourist class restaurant a new vibe as the Caribbean restaurant. Like Carmania, Franconia also had a self-service launderette and her tourist class cabins were pleasantly inviting, especially because they were newly air conditioned and had private facilities. In 1966, Franconia was painted all white and began cruising full time. In the summer, she began cruising to Bermuda from New York, switching to Caribbean cruises to Florida in the winter. Carmania ultimately joined her there after her summer seasons in European waters. While these last two classic Cunarders remain popular links to a more romantic seagoing era, a new breed of purpose-built cruise ships would soon outclass them. In 
in need of major refits to stay relevant. They were laid up in 1971 as Cunard decided their best bet was to focus on new tonnage. And since you've already seen the Carmania story, you know what comes next. After flirting with Ted Arison and his new Carnival cruise lines, they were scooped up by the Soviets, who renamed the Franconia Fedor Shalyapin after the Russian opera singer. By the way, the speed-up photo was one of several displayed on the ship for the next 30 years. Certainly in the beginning of their Soviet careers, these two sturdy ocean liners were ideal for budget cruising. They had those glorious Lido's, full air conditioning and spacious cabins with private facilities. What more could you ask for at the time? For a time, CTC cruises cleverly billed them as the S Capers, taking liberties with the S in Shalyapin and Sobanov and the word escape. While under charter, the two ships had British and Australian hotel staff, but were manned by Soviet officers and crew. Life on board was, with the exception of the occasional bridge tour, casual and fun, with an emphasis on eating, drinking, and frolicking in the sun. To entice potential cruisers, brochures from the time emphasized single ladies and romantic couples. In one gift shop photo, a tea towel of Cunard liners is featured. Perhaps these were leftovers from storage. While not Epicurean, menus from the Chaliopin offered up standard cruise fare of the time, with some Brit favorites like grilled lamb chops with mint sauce for lunch. A 1978 captain's dinner bade passengers farewell with selections like grilled halibut, Diane steak, and apple strudel. Fedor and Leonid spent the next decade or so alternating between charter cruise service and trooping Cuban soldiers to Angola. In this late 1980s photo at Piraeus by Peter Fitzpatrick, the Fedor looks absolutely pristine. After the fall of the Soviet Union, both ships carried on under charter, with the Fedor enjoying strong popularity in the German market. In 1994, she was cruising throughout Europe for Phoenix Sirison. During a call at Amsterdam, Dutch ship enthusiast Bert Pellegram captured her clean but faded interiors, which had changed little other than the soft fittings from her Cunard era. Within a few short months, Fedor quietly sailed off to Ilichovsk, where we would soon be paying her a visit during her third year of layup. So that pretty much brings us up to 1997 in the timeline of these two first Saxonia sisters. But we still have enough time to catch up on their two younger siblings, which went on to very different careers. Named for the Roman province that is now part of southern Austria, Carinthia was the second Cunarder to bear the name. Of these four John Brown built ships, she had the most celebrated godmother, with Her Royal Highness Princess Margaret doing the honors. With a simple yet dignified, I named the ship Carinthia, I wish success to all who sail in her, she sent the third Saxonia sister down the ways and into the River Clyde. Externally, Carinthia looked just like her two sisters, but she had a larger first class with 154 berths, some of which were interchangeable. With the larger first class came a new lounge on sports deck. This would be the most contemporary space with its warm wood tones and crimson and teal color scheme. Unlike the sports deck lounge, the rest of Corinthia's spaces were given a retro feel. The first class restaurant was decked out in French Rococo style and had chairs from the Aquitania's dining room. And the staterooms in first class were especially inviting with furnishings and veneers that had an Odeon vibe. With its tasseled curtains, the cinema theater, which served both classes, was meant to look like an old theater. 
The tourist class lounge, unlike the first two ships, lacked the dome in its center. It was done in Renaissance style and had an adjoining soda fountain with bartenders who were specially trained in the U.S. The Elizabethan style oak paneled tourist class smoking room was situated up on boat deck. It featured a plastic frieze that depicted the life of a Canadian beaver. Like the other ships, tourist class had a dedicated playroom and the restaurant had a Pompeian decorative theme. Although Corinthia made some cruises, she was never properly converted, and without full air conditioning and a nice Lido, she became a tough sell when demand withered for the Atlantic crossing. On December 9, 1967, she was laid up at Southampton and soon joined by her younger sister, Sylvania. In January of 1968, Corinthia was sold to Sitmar Line and renamed Fairland. The best for her was yet to come. Initially, Fairland was to have been rebuilt for line voyages between the UK and Australia. But with that market in decline, Sitmar decided to transform her into a deluxe American-based cruise ship. Fairland was towed to Arsenale Triestino, the famed San Marco shipyard, in February of 1970. That April, she was renamed Fair Sea and underwent a massive transformation. Early renderings portended spacious Lido decks and modern interiors by Italian architect Umberto Nordio. That trademark domed funnel was replaced with a streamlined fin-topped Italian stack, her superstructure was enlarged and rebuilt, and the ship was stripped to the bare steel. When she left Trieste in November 1971 for Los Angeles, her only original features were her machinery and her hull. After a slow start, Sitmar's Fair Sea gave Princess Cruises, their main rival, a run for the money on the Mexican cruise circuit. Having grown up in Los Angeles, I have many fond memories of visits to the spotless Fair Sea between 1974 and 1988. Her decks and lounges were always buzzing with excited passengers and visitors. Her funnel never looked better than with its original buff color and the V logo, which stood for Vlasov, the family entity that owned Sitmar. Fair Sea was always a majestic sight sailing out of Los Angeles. While derided in local advertising by Princess as a converted older ship, she had larger cabins and better deck areas than her Scandinavian-designed rivals. Oh, and here's how to tell the difference between Fair Sea and the otherwise identical Fair Wind, our next Saxonia sister. The top of Fair Sea's funnel had open grating versus Fairwind's solid casing. In 1988, Sitmar was acquired by Princess, who renamed that converted older ship Fair Princess. In 1995, she was to become the Regent Isle, but when Regency Cruises went bankrupt, she was sent to Australia to spend the next few years as P&O Australia's replacement for the Fair Star. In 2000, she became the largely unsuccessful China Sea Discovery, offering gambling cruises from Hong Kong. She was sold for scrap in 2005, and during her demolition at Alang, was completely gutted by fire, resulting in the death of five workers. Her last remains were gone by 2006. All in all, it was a very sad end for what was the last Saxonia sister at the time. The fourth ship in the Saxonia class, Cunard Line's second Sylvania, was named for the Roman province, also known as Transylvania, now part of Romania. Much to the delight of Cunard traditionalists, her layout and classically themed decorative style echoed that of Corinthia's, and like all of her sisters, she was built by John Brown and Company at Clydebank.
Transylvania was launched by Mrs. Norman Robertson, the wife of the Canadian High Commissioner in London, on November 22, 1956. She was completed seven months later and made her maiden crossing to Canada on July 5, 1957. The four handsome Saxonia sisters enjoyed a year or two of glory before the rise of the airliner made them obsolete. Modeled after the boudoir of Madame de Serrilly, the 18th century socialite and lady-in-waiting to Marie Antoinette, the first-class lounge was paneled in sycamore and embellished with mirrors, golden accents, and lacquered furnishings. The Regency-style first-class drawing room was a study in striped burgundy and one of the first non-smoking spaces at sea. And her handsome first-class cabins were showcases of extravagant veneers, like pear, apple, abanita, and white ash burr. Her double-deck cinema's proscenium was framed in stylized lyres and featured a curved balcony. Sylvania's tourist class lounge featured columns lined in a scagiola technique made with a rare Canadian marble. The tourist class drawing room had a Moorish style and the oak and ash paneled tourist class smoking room boasted 17 murals featuring multilingual European proverbs. In the heart of the ship, the gold and white tourist class restaurant had murals depicting the harvesting of fruit. Sylvania's tourist class cabins were inviting enough with their oak and mahogany veneers, but their lack of private facilities would soon become problematic. Sylvania remained on the Canada run until 1960 when she was switched to New York. In 1966, she was painted all white, but unlike the heavily rebuilt Carmania and Franconia, her lack of air conditioning and private facilities limited her appeal as a cruise ship. Sylvania joined Corinthia in layup at Southampton's Berth 101 in May 1968. Shortly thereafter, both ships were sold to Sitmar, with Sylvania getting the new name Fairwind. In January of 1970, she was towed to Trieste for her complete makeover into a stylish modern Italian cruise ship. When completed in 1972, she made a Trans-Pacific crossing and gradually settled into her new role as a Florida-based cruise liner. By the mid-1970s, Fair Sea and Fairwind had become two of the most popular U.S.-based cruise ships and were especially renowned for their Italian food and service. Even rebuilt, they had classic good looks, and their airy Umberto Nordio modern interiors served their tropical itineraries well. Fairwind made the occasional Transcanal cruise to California, and I had the pleasure of visiting her in St. Thomas during my first Caribbean cruise in 1981. Oh, and here's a comparison between the forward funnels of Fairwind and Fair Sea. Either one of those sculpted masterpieces works for me, along with those beautifully terraced teak decks. In 1988, Fairwind was renamed Sitmar Fairwind and given a new Swan-inspired livery, but before that could be applied to the rest of the fleet, Princess Cruises bought Sitmar. Since Wind Princess didn't quite sound right, she was renamed Dawn Princess and remained in the Princess fleet until 1993. I didn't want to talk over that gorgeous Typhon steam whistle, but in 1993, Don Princess was sold to V-Ships, a subsidiary of the Vlasov Group that once owned Sitmar. V-Ships gave her a mechanical overhaul and chartered her to Phoenix Sirison, who renamed her Albatros. I'll tell her full story soon, but Albatros days were numbered by 2003. Renamed Genoa, she was scrapped at a Lang, 
where I last saw her in early 2004. Ironically, all of the Saxonia sisters met their ends here. By my calculations, we've covered about 190 years of Cunard Line history. And now, since we're approaching the shipyard in Ilichovsk, we've got to hide the cameras, and ourselves, to get past the security gate, which is manned by two stout ladies with a taste for cognac. Funny how a little cognac makes people less prone to inspect SUVs with a decidedly western cargo. The next chapter is coming very soon. Have a nice time. Thank you. Oh, and one more quick thing. I'd like to dedicate the first part of this story to my friend Clive Harvey, whose brilliant Saxonia Sisters book was an integral resource in making this video. And please don't forget to subscribe so that this channel can grow. Thank you.